What's the only thing worse than a terrorist with a nuclear weapon? A terrorist with a nuclear weapon who doesn't know what he stands for or what he wants. あ、俺は9番目の男。だから俺の名は9番。俺は太陽を盗んだ男。日本列島を取る。タイトルマッチの続ける刑事に訪れた一度だけのチャンス。50億 The Man Who Stole the Sun is a phenomenal movie, definitely one of the very best satirical films made since Dr. Strangelove. I wish I could just end my review right there and give you a link to watch it online or to buy a US DVD, but that's just not possible right now. So there may be some minor spoilers in the following review, although I will attempt to keep them to a minimum. The second feature film directed by Kazuhiko Hasegawa, Taiyo wo Nusunda Otoko is a two and a half hour long roller coaster of bizarre tropes that shouldn't work nearly as well as it does. The leads are played by teen heartthrob Kenji Sawada as the eccentric high school teacher Makoto Kido, and the veteran actor Stone Cold Bunta Sugawada playing unstoppable police detective Inspector Yamashita. They are joined by the smoking hot Kamiko Ikigami playing disc jockey Zero Sawai. On the surface, this movie is an interesting extrapolation of the concept around accomplishing something to prove that you can do it. Why climb the mountain? Because it's there. Why assemble a nuclear weapon in the comfort of your apartment? Because it's a challenge? As the movie opens, Kido has already been surveilling the local nuclear power plant in preparation for his special personal project. Soon after, he breaks in and manages to steal a fuel rod, which he then refines to plutonium in his home lab before assembling an actual nuclear weapon. This sequence takes up a good chunk of the first hour of the film and is simultaneously engrossing and disturbing, particularly for a demonstrably primitive home laboratory, although there are reportedly key stages that are demonstrated or elaborated on for various reasons, or I should say obvious reasons. Once the bomb is assembled, it's time to put the next stage of the plan into action, but when he calls the government to start making demands, Keto finds out he can't think of any demand to make of the government other than to prevent his TV baseball games from being preempted by the nightly news. Way to think big there, guy. Turns out Kido doesn't even have any demands. He's a nuclear terrorist who's tied his own hands, and it's blackly hilarious. Before going any further, let's go back to the rest of the cast. Sugawada's Yamashita crosses paths with Kido at the beginning of the film when he intervenes to assist in a bloody bus hijacking involving Kido's high school class trip. Consequently, Yamashita is also the only government official Kido can think of to request by name to speak with when he phones in his various comments and challenges. Ikegami's disc jockey enters the picture similarly when Kido sees her running a live broadcast downtown and phones in to ask for suggestions on what sort of demand to make. He's really that short on ideas. 
The first idea he wrote down and crossed out after the baseball demand was to simplify the college entrance examination process. I'm not sure if that was simply too bland and or selfless for him. He's definitely self-centered, but he never reached out to the media for publicity through anything more than his tongue-in-cheek exchanges with Zero. The plot continues from this point, building to some amazing climaxes, a number of elements of which were seen in the trailer. And while there are slow moments throughout the movie, there are no dull moments, and that's the key factor here. Moving on, I'd like to discuss several other elements of this movie that I find engaging and entertaining. The bomb construction elements are remarkably engaging, largely due to Sawada's excellent performance, truly gripping when you consider how risky every single step of that activity would have been in a real scenario, not just to Kido, but to every person in a five-mile radius. This film was made in 1979 when domestic protests still turned violent on a regular basis, evidenced by the hijacking scenario and again when a leftist terrorist is blamed for the attack on the nuclear power plant based on the design of a bomb used at the scene of the crime. As another sign of the times, the name that Kido comes up for himself when he calls the police is Nine. In essence, he is naming himself the Ninth Nuclear Power, after the U.S., Soviet Union, China, the U.K., France, India, and the assumed nuclear nations of South Africa and Israel. Obviously, the crime of breaking and entering into a power plant, stealing fissionable material, and injuring multiple employees after previously stealing a police pistol puts to rest the argument about doing it purely as an academic project. Clearly, Kido is a little more sociopathic than his public persona would suggest, although even the elements we see of him at home alone don't show much more than that. I'm not as familiar with the Japanese cinematic or political culture of the late 70s, but one of the most interesting questions is how movie-going audiences would have reacted to a movie like this in 1979 compared to 2017. As featured in the film, probably not accurate for budget reasons if nothing else, the public safety security aspect is only given the barest hint, although one can certainly imagine roving bands of military and police with Geiger counters trying to trace the location of the bomb, given the efficiency we've seen demonstrated by them in real-world scenarios. In another surprise, there's no apparent gag order on the news or rumors that nuclear material was stolen, a far cry from some of the censorship that we may have grown to expect more recently. Finally, I believe it's enlightening to briefly compare the simplicity of this two-and-a-half-hour film simply framed with lengthy technical sequences, yet gripping and extremely well plotted, with, say, the anime series Resonance of Fate, the key being that both of these focus on the threat of domestic nuclear terrorism. Any anime or feature, Japanese or probably U.S. for that matter, film, made in the last 20 years, is most likely oozing in conspiracy theories and various agencies and organizations acting at cross-purposes with the overall aim at stopping the terrorist. In contrast, The Man Who Stole the Sun is a beautifully, simply framed thriller that needs absolutely no embellishment. I must give another shout out over to Sordar at GenjiPress.com as well for this. Link below. I first read his review about this movie about 15 years ago. His disc was apparently a two disc special edition, but I've not been able to locate additional details on the special features. And I was psyched to check it out during my first major import phase, only to find out the disc was already out of print. Fast forward to 2013, on a whim I went digging for it again. I guess the Japanese Region 2 exclusive was reissued around 2006, apparently the same remastered presentation, but bare bones this time, that includes a trailer in English subtitles, but nothing else. The quality is pretty solid for a film from the period, and the audio and video are both excellent. And I've included at least one link below to a e-store where it's still available online. I've read that some Western audiences at the time of its initial release had very mixed opinions on this one, but from my perspective, it's a solid, entertaining, blackly humorous thriller that deserves to be re-released worldwide. I give The Man Who Stole the Sun my highest recommendation. With this review of a 1979 movie, I guess I've also cracked a bit of a self-imposed date limit on my review format, and you can expect to see some more older films reviewed in the future that fall under my various interests. If you enjoy reviews and commentary on films like this, please like the video, subscribe, feel free to leave comments. As always, new reviews on Thursdays. Lieutenant Fish, out.